Hi, I'm Susan Weisbauer, co-author of The Well-Trained Mind. And I'm Susanna Jarrett, editor at The Well-Trained Mind Press. And we're talking about education for all parents and for all children in all sorts of settings. And today we are so excited to have Julie Bogart from Brave Rider back with us. Thank you for Yay, coming. Hey, Julie. Always a pleasure. Love seeing you both. Julie, thank you so much for coming back. We had Julie on the season uh, on last season to talk about our different approaches to teaching writing. If you haven't listened to that episode, it was a, such a fun conversation. And uh, Julie, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do for those who may not uh, be familiar? Oh, thanks. Yeah. So my name is Julie Bogart. I own a company called Brave Rider. I homeschooled my five kids who are now all adults, and I have participated in Susan's work even when I was a homeschooler. I read The Well-Trained Mind, was on her discussion board, and uh, so it's always a joy to spend time together. Thanks for having me. Well, and I have to say, um, Julia, there there are a few homeschool speakers slash authors uh, slash presenters that I have felt I have, you know, um, in the words of Anne of Green Gables, were my bosom friends, you know, my... <laughs> Yes. My kindred souls. And I think pretty much from the moment that I met Julie, I felt that way. And as it turns out, Julie, you and I, we haven't had exactly parallel paths, but they've been pretty similar. And that I think we both started homeschooling maybe a little earlier than some of our listeners. So, yes. yes. So tell us a little bit about how, you know, the years that you were homeschooling and what that was like for you. Oh, my goodness. You know, I first heard about homeschooling in 1984. Ooh. And and it was a friend of my not yet fiance's, and he was sort of checking me out to see if I was going to be a good a good wife candidate for his friend. Oh my! And so yeah, so he asked me, "Are you going to homeschool your children?" And uh -huh. I had never heard those two words together. I said, "Home what?" He said, "Homeschool." And I said, "I have no idea what you're talking about." So this is '84, and he started describing this very um, back then, in particular, very religious, very patriotic very anti-communist kind of movement <laughs> of home <laughs> education. And I was a little bit like perplexed by that. And then he pivoted and he started talking about how you could tailor make the education to your children's needs. And for some reason, that really stuck with me. I think because I had kind of an amazing public school upbringing. I was raised in Southern California, hippie culture. My middle school was in Malibu Canyon. And all my teachers were oh my like goodness. first generation Peace Corps volunteers. And so they were incredibly innovative and creative educators. But by the time I got to college at UCLA, where I actually worked as an assistant teacher in a middle school where there was busing, I saw this complete pivot away from sort of that organic way of learning to test-based and assessment-based learning. And so when I heard this vision cast of homeschooling, I was like, this might be the way I can give my kids the kind of education I had in school. Isn't that ironic? But that's what really stood out to me in 1984. Mm -hmm. By the time I had my kids, I was living in the States and I started homeschooling in 1991. Uh, it was certainly pre-internet. Mm -hmm. We were gathering at the time I was attending church and we were gathering at the church to kind of have meetings. I hoodwinked multiple friends into moving to my neighborhood. So at one point, there were five families living in condos on this little cul-de-sac in Orange County, California. And we just had like an amazing experience of learning together. We did our own thing in our houses and then we'd get out of our houses and create the gold rush or the Pony Express, or we would line up like we were the solar system. And these were ways that we had both like the social engagement, but also the tailor-made learning. I used Family Fun as my main guide for learning. I loved that magazine and I found it so mm -hmm. supportive of this sort of kinesthetic-based learning. I read Raymond and Dorothy Moore. Um, I really took to heart this idea that reading was something that would happen developmentally and to not overly stress about it. I feel like my origin story with homeschooling is this tailor-made, kinesthetic, creative expression of learning. And I didn't have 
of a lot of stress in the early years. Now, when the internet started, I was thrilled to be a part of those kinds of communities. But that initial, I was sort of in a nice cocoon, I would say, for my first years of home education. That's so interesting. And and I'm going to get to a minute in which, in the ways in which you and I had completely opposite, but also the same experiences. So we're going to, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Um, so where, oh, I have so many questions. So um, where would you say, you said little stress in those early years. Julie, when did the stress set in? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's definitely stress. I remember with my second child, she woke up on her fifth birthday and said, hooray, today's the day I will learn to read. And then she wow. did not read until she was eight and a half. So (laughs) three and a half years of expecting to read and not reading did create some stress. I will say that candidly, but it was in reading some of these books. You know, I read about Charlotte Mason's philosophy. I read Better Late Than Early. Mm -hmm. And I actually consulted with an educational specialist who was in the independent study programs of California at the time. And she started meeting with my daughter and a very interesting thing happened one day. I was watching her work with my daughter and it suddenly dawned on me, Johanna could sound out words, phrases Mm -hmm. sometimes, and then we'd give her a different book and she couldn't do any of it. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly realized this was a child who was quite artistic and it dawned on me that the font changes might be throwing her off. Oh. And so I I started having her highlight A's that had serifs, that were sans serif, that were handwritten, that were in cursive. Mm-hmm. And then we would do the B and all of a sudden she read. She and figured out, if, if, can, if I could just go down a tiny rabbit hole yes. just for yes. a minute. In the first edition of The Well-Trained Mind, we recommended Teach Your Child to Read in 100 Easy Lessons. Yes. And mm-hmm. after that first edition, we eliminated that, not because it didn't teach kids how to read, but because the font changes in it. Mm-hmm. messed so many children up that they were looking for a visual clue that wasn't there anymore. That's interesting. That's the program we use. That is so interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's one of those things where the woman I was working with, she was like blown away that I came up with that. But here's mm-hmm. what triggered it. And this is why I love homeschooling. I knew my daughter really mm-hmm. well. And so when she was learning to speak, she spoke pretty early, but like she was overly discriminating. So a chair wasn't a a chair wasn't a chair. There was a rocker. There was an mm-hmm. armchair. Like she wasn't generalizing. She was overly mm-hmm. specific. And mm-hmm. that's what was happening with the fonts. She was seeing the letters too well. Right. And so I think that early experience of breakthrough actually supported me quite a bit. I started to realize, oh, we're going to problem solve. This isn't right. mm-hmm. only ever going to be awful. We're going to actually have these amazing breakthroughs. And um, and I there was a lot of joy because we were doing what I call party school. We threw tons of parties. <laughs> I just constantly thought, if we can teach this with a party, that's what we're doing. And my kids really took to that. And we did it in community. So it was very fun. So I just want to compare and contrast my own experience. I think that probably one of the reasons, Julie, you and I sort of um, have always met on a really really basic level is that although my parents were actually very fundamentalist Christians when I was growing up, and there was that aspect of, you know, public schools are a dens of iniquity, not so much (laughs) from my parents, but definitely from the religious community that we were part of. Mm -hmm. That wasn't why they chose to homeschool. My mother, had been a public school teacher and she homeschooled us because she wasn't convinced that each one of us would get what we needed because we're all very different. I have an older brother, I have a younger sister, and we all learned very differently. My older brother's an engineer. I am very much a word person. My younger sister's very artistic. And she just didn't think that we would get the individualized attention that we needed. So our homeschooling was never a matter of, I am protecting you from the big, bad outside world. Same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I I think that's where you and I, you and I have connected. Now, having said that, and I'm interested to hear your experience in this, you had a great public school experience. I never went to public school, right? Okay. Um, So when I started homeschooling my own children, it was, again, not a, I'm going to protect you from the big bad world, but I want to reproduce what was successful for me, what I enjoyed. Yes. I I think for me, it was more a matter of, people, people sometimes don't understand this, but you will. The thought of getting the kid to the bus and off the bus at the same time every day felt so oppressive to me. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. I used to joke that the main reason I homeschooled is so I didn't have to do paperwork. Like the <laughs> idea of turning in all these papers to get them enrolled in school felt just oppressive. I had no interest in that. <laughs> I, I just, I remember so clearly when my, so I have four kids and they were, you know, at, at one point they were between two and 10 years old and we would get up in the morning and there were some days where I was like, we're not doing school today. We're going to have an adventure to the point where my youngest, my daughter, Emily, would get up in the morning and say, adventure, 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 because that's what she wanted to do. But that having that flexibility to get up in the morning and say, you know, what? we're going to go on a field trip. Yes, we're going to go outside. We're, we're not. Yes. Going. And the thought of being tied to a school schedule and them having to go in and do standardized exams instead to me no. kind of just felt like death. I had the same experience. And I think that's one of the things when I hear criticism of homeschooling, what they're picturing is like the American flag, a school desk, mm -hmm. reciting the Pledge of Allegiance and, you know, sort of grinding through workbooks. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the homeschooling world I entered. Now, my sister-in-law, who's a good 10 years older than me, mm -hmm. she was in the generation where they kept the blinds closed until mm -hmm. the 330 right. bus release. And they chugged through the paces, you know, those workbooks. And, and that education felt very small to me. And I knew that I would never do that with my kids. Like that mm -hmm. was not what I thought homeschooling should be. But by the time I came along, it was legal. Mm -hmm. So I often feel like we're pretty hard on that early generation who was actually blazing a path and doing the best they could with very limited resources. I found your book, I think it was in the late 90s. And I'll tell you, the thing I loved about The Well-Trained Mind immediately were your book lists mm -hmm. and your approach to writing. And I think we talked about this on the last podcast, but what I could detect was that you were a writer. <laughs> you were yeah. an yeah. educator talking about writing. You were actually coming from that origin story. And I admired your intellect so much. And I really wanted my children, as they got older, to enter into the intellectual life. And mm -hmm. so I felt like classical education and Charlotte Mason broadened my early experience of teaching, which was really valuable for us. Now I'm curious as so we have this we have this shared experience of entering into homeschooling not for primarily social or religious reasons but just because right. we we wanted to educate our kids. I will say that I, I don't know that this is so much true from my own experience of being homeschooled because to be honest that was in the 1970s. You know, I know. It, was a wow. it was it was a long time ago, the, and finding a social group that was that were that just it didn't exist right just right. didn't happen. But when I was homeschooling my own children, which was in the 90s, yes, what I found was that I couldn't really, I'm in Southeastern Virginia and you're on the opposite coast. So we probably had very different experiences here, mm -hmm. but I couldn't find a homeschool community that I felt comfortable in mm. because everyone that I could find or everyone who was organized enough to have a group, I'm doing bunny quotes, you can't see it because we don't have video on our, sorry, podcast, <laughs> but you know, had, was organized enough they were organized around religious convictions and around religious sensibilities. I mean, I remember when my kids were little, I enrolled them in a homeschool choir mm. in Williamsburg because um, they all wanted to do music. We're a very musical family. We always have been. And it turned out that most of the people who were doing this, that it turned out to be a, a very um, conservative Presbyterian choir. I didn't know that when I signed up for it. A lot of the parents who were bringing their kids to this homeschool choir had serious religious objections to classical education. Wow. You know, that their kids were going to be mm. exposed to, to false gods. And <sighs> I walked in with my children and said, hi, I'm Susan Bauer. And it was like the silence fell over the whole room. And literally people were whispering in corners to each other. Oh, no. My kids, of course, were oblivious to this, but it was the most awkward experience that I have had because these were all people my age, right? With kids, same age as my kids. It's not like I had any sort of um, authority or at that point, I mean, we had just published The Well-Trained Mind, any sort of even track record with my own kids. And it was so, sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to like, you know, verbal process therapy a little bit here. It was so disorienting. Yes. I think it was years before I tried again to go to any sort of homeschool group wow. with my kids. 
Gosh, Susan, I so understand that, though. You know, Southern California, back in the early 90s, I like I said, I was kind of in a cocoon. We were in a sort of a, a the church had conservative values, but it was a charismatic church. It was a very baptized at the ocean kind of church. It was, mm-hmm. you know, vineyard music kind of church. So right. it, it didn't have that sort of East Coast fundamentalism or that Southern fundamentalism that I came to discover much later. But we had our own... We had our own sort of weirdnesses, right? Like there was kind of feelings about R-rated movies or PG movies. I, mm-hmm. I found myself limiting certain kind of music. Like I fell into some of that. Mm-hmm. But then I moved to Ohio in 99, halfway through the homeschooling journey. And I went to the statewide convention with a bunch of homeschool moms that I met here. And the person who spoke had 13 kids. They were all dressed similarly, right? Homemade clothes. And this guy, I had the audacity to say that all children's literature was dangerous to children and that we needed to buy the books he wrote because they were the only ones that showed children obeying parents. And I about fell out of my chair. I turned to my two friends. I'm like, is this what homeschooling in Ohio is? Like it Mm. flabbergasted me. They assured me that it wasn't. Um, I was a part of a co-op that had 100 families in it, but I got... I got rolled multiple times. I had a son who wore a Harry Potter t-shirt to the co-op and the (laughs) teacher of one of his classes took the whole class to explain to him that I was a bad mother for (gasps) exposing him to this. Yes. In front of the whole class. And I had, they invited me years later to speak at a graduation and a whole bunch of parents wouldn't come because I was a woman speaking at a graduation. So I have had some of those exposures and you and I've talked about how it manifested in the convention circuit. Yep. But yes, and, if, and and listeners, if you haven't heard that, go back to our um, writing podcast, which Susanna, maybe you can link it in the show notes. And when we we got thoroughly off topic and talked about homeschool conventions. So sorry, we go did. ahead, Julie. <laughs> but but all I'll say is this is similar to you. I kept the main thing, the main thing, which was mm-hmm. education. Mm-hmm. And so we would adapt, we would learn, we would find our friends, we would take what we liked and leave the rest you know, good 12 step principle. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I was going through a big transition myself during those years that I homeschooled because my own intellectual life was being awakened through Mm -hmm. online conversation. And I was recalling the things I valued in college and what I valued as a child raised in Southern California. And that really helped our homeschool. And some of my kids as a result went to public high school, not all of them, but they did because they were curious about this other world. So in the end, I was not motivated by religious reasoning, but I was definitely at times influenced by it. And that's normal when you spend time in community. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. And and I always find that I am um I'm walking a, a tightrope between dismissing what I now see as I'm going to use the word religious as opposed to Christian. Yes. Um, Religious (laughs) oppressions, objections, being pushed away by people who had a certain form of Christianity that had more to do with culture than it did with Christ, which is who Christianity is named after. But I'm always walking a tightrope between that and appearing to like dismiss Christianity altogether, which I mean, I'm still a Christian. I I will always be a Christian, I think, because I've been called. I can't push it away. But there is so much in in the Christian communities that we have been part of that I've had to parse out and sort out and and try to dismiss without dismissing the faith. You know, that's why I went to grad school. I got a master's in theology just so I could sort through all of those thorny issues. Where did you go? I went to Xavier University here oh, in Cincinnati. Oh, yeah. amazing. Yes. Yeah. And that was the four best years of my life, defending my thesis. I always say I loved giving birth and all of that, but defending my thesis is my favorite thing I've ever done, you know, to an audience of three. Um, <laughs> I wrote about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and it was Wow. really a powerful a powerful journey and i think even that experience catalyzed like my book raising critical thinkers mm-hmm. um because i think what i really wanted for my children was the capacity to think their way away from me or other people if that's what they needed to do mm-hmm. i wanted them to have the tools to self interrogate I wanted them to feel confident that they were not being um, led by people who should not be followed.
followed. Mm -hmm. These were all sort of evidences over time within the homeschooling community that I found problematic. Uh, I remember being at a conference and this, this little group of leaders called me over and they said, hey, Julie, we're talking about dating and courtship. You didn't allow your kids to date, right? And <laughs> yeah, and I paused and I said, you know, I'm not really in the room when that decision's getting made. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they were surprised by that. And they said, well, couldn't you just say they're not allowed to date? And I said, yeah, but couldn't they say, hey, I'm going to the mall with a girlfriend and a boy shows up? Like, I don't, mm-hmm. I'm not with them all the time. They're making their own decisions. And I think for me, that's what homeschooling and my own life became about. How do we cultivate that agency so that each person has the capacity to think for themselves? And to be fair, I, I put a kid in public school and one of his biology teachers actually was propagandizing a religious perspective on the origins of the world in a public school. And I want to point that out because public school doesn't necessarily assume secular either in certain regions of the country. Yeah. And secular has its own issues too. It, it, it can create its own rigid set of rules. So I think mm-hmm. education to me is about that critical thinking piece. And I really think, Susan, your work has been a significant contributor to valuing that in the homeschool space because outside of it, I wasn't finding it. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, yeah. No, and and sometimes I have I have not so much um, in the past, in the future, in the present, uh, more in the past, and I hope not in the future, but in the present, there I feel like there are so many more voices with that yes. perspective. But that's partly because the homeschool movement is growing up, and there's more that's of us it, with grown right? children now. And here's the thing about having grown children, and this is why, dear listeners, you should never listen to parenting advice from someone who has children under the age of ten. When with, and there's a lot of it out there. Is as your as your children get older, you have to. If you're at all self reflective, if you are at all conscientious, if you are at all trying to do a decent job, you have to stop and say to yourself, "I was sold a bill of goods. I was told that my job as a parent was to control this child, Oof. and now I we were both sold that. I assume. I mean, it was really out there. It was out there, but I was rejecting it. I was a La Leche yes. League leader and an attachment parent, so but yeah. it was definitely pressure. Like that pressure existed. Yes. So, I mean, so you rejected it earlier than I did. You sounds like you rejected it, you know, sort of from the get go. I as a I mean, I'm I'm a middle child. I was good. (laughs) I went to a Baptist school. I listened to this until I actually had children. And I looked at them and I thought, these are not units to be controlled. And I can try, but it won't work. I mean, I think for me, it really became a pragmatic decision of I can browbeat these children into doing what I want to a certain point, but they're just going to explode afterwards anyway. And is that really what I want to be doing? No, it isn't. I mean, look, Julie, I grew I grew up, I mean, me as a child, I grew up in the world where, you know, if a baby cries when you're changing it, you smack it on the bottom because I know, isn't that terrible? But that's what I grew up with because it's showing defiance. Right. Right. And if, oh. it, if a child shows defiance, you have to crack down on it immediately because otherwise, you know, they'll be smoking and turning tricks on the street by the time they're 12. I'm really not even exaggerating here. I know you're not. And I will say this, what was interesting about the way that I went when I went sort of this like attachment parenting, responsive parenting, Mm -hmm. that has really become the popular modality now, what people call gentle parenting. But I kind of tease the younger generation about it because I think that a lot of times we could just call it manipulative parenting. There is still still a lack of critical thinking that's happening. So what's happening is the parent thinks if I just explain my reasoning, then Mm -hmm. somehow I'm being gentler. But what they're doing is they're doubling down on the authority. So they're first saying, do it because I said so. The child doesn't Mm -hmm. want to. And they're saying, well, science says, or school says, or this is what a responsible person does. Instead of actually being curious and investigating, noticing, Mm -hmm. having deeper conversations. Um, I I notice it all the time now that I'm a grandmother, and I'm sure you're a grandma too. You know, I am. You can explain to a four-year-old, you know, here's the reason you should wash your hands. Mm -hmm. But it may not have anything to do with why she doesn't want to wash her hands. And so what you're trying to do is control the behavior, even if you're doing it with a nice voice. 
And so when we Mm -hmm. talk about letting go of control, I think it means being fundamentally curious about what's presenting as though you know nothing. It's a Mm -hmm. posture of humility rather than a posture of I know best. And that is a tricky place to be. It doesn't mean that you don't know best. It doesn't mean that sometimes you don't need to intervene. But I think the posture, the position to start with is, oh, this child doesn't want to wash her hands. I want to know more about that. Why is that? What can Mm -hmm. I, yes, what can I do to make it happen? We might have to have you back for a whole episode on on parenting styles and homeschooling. (laughs) I know because we have, we have other things to talk about, but okay. Okay. I'm sorry, (laughs) Susanna, but but Susanna, can I just follow up on that for a minute? (laughs) Okay. All right. All right. So this is so interesting because um, you guys are going to have to forgive me as I go off on a tiny bit of another rabbit trail here. So uh, I ride dressage horses. Yes. Right. Right. So So impressive. when, when you're riding, well, it's not that impressive, but I really enjoy it. When you're riding dressage, what you're doing is you're basically, you're sitting on top of a giant six year old. You're sitting on top of a six-year-old that weighs 1,200 pounds oh my and gosh. also has prey instincts. So, you know, can just like at any minute be like, wolf, gone. So you have to figure out how to communicate with this animal. So I had this long conversation with my dressage coach, who is an internationally recognized dressage judge. She's very, very good. And I said, you know, I really think that when I'm dealing with this horse, because my best trained dressage horse is she's 12 years old, which is adult for a horse. I said, I really think I'm communicating with her the way I do with my adult children, which is I'm like, let's think about how let's think about how you're feeling. Let's think about how you're responding. Why are you responding that way? How can I help you respond better? And my coach says, "Okay, expert in education. (laughs) At what age do you just tell a kid to do something and then figure out why afterwards? And I said, six. And she said, all right, you're writing a six year old. Tell the six-year-old what you need her to do and be very clear about it. Because the problem is, as you are explaining why you're losing the clarity of what you actually want this horse to do and you're confusing her, Mm. right? And I thought about it. I was like, no, okay, that's true. So I go out the next day and the mayor is like, I don't want to get on the bed. It's all technical dressage stuff. I don't want to do that. And I was like, nope, you're going to do it. And she says, okay. And then she does it. (laughs) Then after that, we were able to have a conversation about why. So I just, it just made me think so much about how we interact with our kids and that fine and always changing line between do it because I said so. I mean, there is definitely a place for that, but do it because I said so should never be the end of the conversation. Or even the primary one, right? Because I always think back to that, oh, that book, uh, what is his last name? His first name is Ross. I can't think of it now. How to Really Love Your Child. But he talks about the emotional bank. And Susanna how will much find you, it and put it in the notes. I'm going to put yes. it in the show notes. <laughs> how, I think it's Ross Campbell. Ross Campbell, How to Really Love Your Child. Anyway, hmm. he talks about making these deposits into their emotional bank. And so mm-hmm. if you're constantly withdrawing on the do it because I said so, eventually right. you're, you're running into the red. There's nothing right, to draw. Right. right. So you have to pick your moments. Is this just the habit that you always say, put on your shoes, get in the car seat, don't Mm -hmm. pinch your sister? Or are there Mm -hmm. times where you actually are patient enough to find out? Sometimes we got to just buckle them in and drive to Target. But if that's been a source of conflict, isn't it worth investigating later instead of only ever doubling down, like you said, having the conversation after? What's going on there? What do we need to address differently? And of course, all of this takes time. And so what I say to parents all the time is, you only have to do it once a month. <laughs> you only have to One go down the trail month. <laughs> once, once a month where you actually care about what they're thinking. Because yeah, if you have five kids, it's that's five already five conversations. Too many. Right. It's a lot. We'll be back after this. Looking for audiobooks and stories that your children will love and you won't get sick of hearing even after the 15th time? Well-Trained Mind Press offers over 75 audio titles, from bedtime stories to myths and legends from around the world, to fascinating tales of great men and women from throughout history, to unabridged performances of classic books like The Wizard of Oz and My Father's Dragon. Available at welltrainedmind.com or wherever you purchase audiobooks. On the Well-Trained Mind website, use the code PODCAST to get a 15% discount on any items not already discounted.
So what I really love about the conversation you and I are having here, Julian, we definitely I'm sorry, you are now a a semi permanent guest on our podcast. (laughs) We've got it. We've got to do this again. I love the fact that you and I are talking about this, but we're talking about it without a heavy handed. This is how you earn salvation or this is how you Mm. this is how you do it right. We're talking Mm. about it in terms of. We are figuring this out as we go and we go down trails and then we back up because we got to a dead end and we start in another direction and then we go the other way. And then we think to ourselves, actually, we're explaining too much and we back up and we get a little more authoritarian and then we think, nope, I'm being too hard nosed. And that is the nature of parenting. And when you're you're home educating, you do the same thing with your school subjects because it's an extension of your parenting. Sometimes you crack down too much. Sometimes you explain too much. You have to just be sensitive to that and be willing to adjust. You know, I'm so glad this is the pivot you just took because I think when I hear criticism of homeschooling, what I really hear is criticism of parenting. And I really always want to make that distinction. Like home education is its own thing. But what creates like the problem adults, the ones who have trauma, it's the parenting mechanism. It's not Mm -hmm. just the learning. It's the way that the parents have organized that child's entire experience of growing up. And the reason some people would prefer those kids to be in school is so they at least get a break from that authoritarianism or that Mm -hmm. abusiveness, right? So when I want to protect the reputation of homeschooling, I always want to come back to the idea that fundamentally home education is very tied to your parenting style. Mm -hmm. And being the kind of parent that cares about learning primarily more than forming a child into a certain specific vision of an adult, Mm -hmm. you're going to have a better educational experience and so is your child. Mm -hmm. Like the education needs to be primary and the parenting style needs to support education, not this weird character formation thing (laughs) that I think does not work. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm glad you brought that up and none of this is anywhere in our show notes, by the way, but you know, we're just going to go with it. I always have, and I've had people ask me why this is, and I've been unable, to be honest, to articulate why I have such a negative reaction to character formation curricula. As soon as I see that, it's just like my hackles go up and I think, no, no, I I guess, I guess my, my sort of instinctive reaction is, I'm sorry, you can't form character. Right. Me too. I agree with that actually. Okay, well, talk about your your aspect as why that is, because I think a lot of homeschooling parents do think that they should be forming character. Mm-hmm. Well, I think because character is formed internally. So I don't think yeah. there's an external power that can create character. And so what we're really talking about with character formation is character indoctrination. Here are the set of values that I expect you to adopt. I'm going to lecture you into it. I'm going to do... I remember some homeschooling guru that I listened to saying that he used to give give different size amounts of ice cream to his eight kids. One would get barely any. Another one would get three scoops to teach them to value whatever they got and to not be jealous. Do you think that's what those kids were learning? Okay, that's horrifying. It's horrifying. (laughs) But this is when people talk about character formation, it's like they're thinking of these pony tricks of how do I get my kids to do it? When really what you want to do is actually live into your own values around your children so that they have this experience of trustworthiness and a sense that values matter. And then they have the opportunity to either adopt some of those for themselves or adopt a variation or a theme of them. But I, Mm -hmm. yes, I'm allergic to this formation because to me, that just sounds like coercion and control with a prettier name. I wonder if, actually, I feel like I should stop right now and see if Susanna has something to say. (laughs) No, (laughs) I am just, I am listening. I'm all ears. You know, I'm at the very, very beginning of my parenting journey, Mm. not to homeschooling yet. And so hearing all of this, I'm just, I'm taking in all the wisdom of those who've come before me. And it's, it's really interesting to listen to. (laughs) Okay. Well, you have both of our email addresses. (laughs) I know. And it's, and it's funny because, you know, we came in to talk about the, the history of homeschooling, but I guess we're getting a lot more of 
sort of the fundamental issues that affect homeschooling at a very deep level, which... I mean, honestly, this is the history. I don't know if you remember, Kono's curriculum is all about character formation. But what I loved about it is it was very kinesthetic and you could just sort of experience the values rather than indoctrinating them. And I think that's what we're... So yes, this is all right in line and why we are the way we are today, I think. It sounds like to me that parenting styles change over time and kind of what's the current thing. And that impacts homeschooling. But what what I'm also hearing is that there is a bit of a mismatch for you all personally between the going parenting style when you're raising your child and choosing to homeschool and you're already making a choice that's a little bit non-traditional and what you were doing with your children. So, you know, we talked a lot in this podcast about outside gaze and dealing with that. How was that all for you? And did it change over the course of the time you were homeschooling your kids with the pushback from the outside. Mm. Mm. So, so here's, here's a way, Julie, in which, although, you know, you were talking about you're, you're in California and I'm in Southeastern Virginia, but, but a way I think in which we were both able to, um, I don't know if resist is the right word, but at least concept, um, give context to that outside gaze. I mean, for me, that outside gaze was, I mean, we, we, my family were all Bill Gothard-ish when I was wow. growing up, which I know, which is a whole different <laughs> thing, and which maybe is part of my revulsion towards character curricula because that was all about character, oh, yeah. right? Um, but we also, though, lived on a farm, right? And and so we were already leading this sort of non-traditional life and that it really didn't matter whether there was character development or not. The chickens had to be watered at eight o'clock in the morning when it was seven degrees in January with hot water and we just went out and did it. So in a lot of ways, I feel like when, and I'm talking about now me as a child, living in a rural area and having a farm-based lifestyle protected us in a way Mm. from that pressure to have kids develop in a certain way and display certain characteristics because those were already being trained into us just by having to take care of animals. Does that make sense? It totally does. And I think that's one of the challenges for true suburbanites like me. Mm. You don't have sort of the community of a downtown culture, you Mm -hmm. you know, where you're walking to coffee shops and barber shops and all of that, but you also don't have farm life. So you're stuck out in the suburbs and character formation becomes comes these ideals, Mm. which are demonstrated through this kind of set of criteria that equals conservative politics or conservative religion. And and to me, that's both not character or even values. When I look back on my five kids, I can see what formation happened and it's all just by being caught. So our family values international experiences and people from other cultures and other languages. Our family values giving away things because we gave away so many things. That's just Mm kind of how we, we gave away a car. We gave away, we were those kind of people. So I see that mirrored now in my adults, but we didn't set out to teach it, right? We let them be around us (laughs) and we did our things. I feel like the the changing landscape of homeschooling over the last 20 years is that the education piece has finally taken center stage. Mm-hmm. And some of this, we're going to raise the next generation for Christ that saves American culture. Right, right. That has kind of fallen away as the primary mission. And I think that's for the best because those adult kids are telling us that that was too big of a burden to be placed on their shoulders when they were teens. Yeah, no, that no, I, I 100% I agree. I will say that one of the things, and I know, you know, home, and we should talk a little bit about this. I mean, definitely when I was homeschooling my elementary students and when I was homeschooling my high school students, and of course, you and I both now have adults who were homeschooled. We're not homeschooling anymore. So right. we should talk a little bit about how we see those transitions, how they went, what shifted. But I, I would say that one of the things that I see in homeschooling families now, um, and I'm sure this is self-selecting because I'm an academic. I won the Rail Trade Mind Academy, which is very academic. So I certainly hear from more homeschoolers who are very academically oriented rather than sort of more lifestyle oriented. But I see a lot of um, reproducing of 
of sort of elite high school experiences in order to get into the very best colleges. Mm. So I see a lot of homeschoolers who are trying to figure out what's the equivalent of an AP class. How many college courses can my student take? How many credits can we get? How many extracurricular activities can we do? So even though they're homeschoolers, they're reproducing some of the more destructive aspects of a competitive, like private school, high school experience. And my children, well, again, I'm just, I know I keep playing the farm card, but because we're sort of like out here, I don't think any of my kids really felt that, but I see it so much with younger families that are coming along. Yeah. You know, I was doing some research into millennials and I have a friend who is really into these generational pieces. And she was saying that kids who are raised, not homeschooled, but millennials who Mm -hmm. go through the traditional system, they have been shepherded for so long in a much more specific way than like you and I were when we were in high school. And achievement is scripted and there are mm-hmm. markers that prove that you've gotten it, mm-hmm. that that when they come into the homeschooling space, it's harder for them to shed that memory because the pressure was so powerful. Like, I mean, I, I went to UCLA, but when I went back in the 70s, like my SAT score didn't even matter. I had a high enough GPA. So I think I was hungover when I took the test. I mean, it was, you know what I'm saying? Like it it had nothing to do with what these kids are feeling today. So I can imagine that some of them who come into homeschooling for the academic side are feeling that pressure to reproduce what they experienced on some level. Mm -hmm. I tend to be over on this more lifestyle side of homeschooling. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the fair contrast between us. And what I've noticed is the, the way that they think about it is, how can I create a life that doesn't take all that in and yet still benefits, gets the same result? Mm -hmm. And part of what I feel like I I loved about your book, Rethinking uh, School, was that you were reminding us that those markers are damaging. They're not just Mm -hmm. maybe necessary or unnecessary, but they're harmful. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's the, that's the piece I always return to. I have a few kids who did public high school and one of them in particular is a high achiever. He ended up on a full ride at Columbia law school and he went to Ohio state for his undergrad. And one of the things he has said to me since is at least he wasn't burned out. Like Mm -hmm. he watched his peer group who were high performers just kind of give up in college. Whereas he was just ramping up. He was like, okay, hey, I'm willing to compete at this level, but he hadn't been doing it for 12 years. And so I think that's one of the contrasts as well. Like give your kids, I I wish everyone could homeschool from kindergarten to eighth grade. I feel like give them a great foundation Mm -hmm. before they have to burn out on these high pressure demands. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did you homeschool yours all the way through high school? So no, my oldest, yes. My second did part-time high school. And then my younger three did various numbers of years of high school, two years, three years, and four years. Yeah. yeah. And that was a little bit of our experience as well. And then my 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 older two, I did all the way through. My third did more of like a hybrid sort of thing. Yes. And then my youngest actually, not high school, but actually did seventh, eighth, ninth grade at a Montessori school. And then we, so you just, you know, you yeah. adjust as you go on. Uh, But, you know, I'll say that with my kids, and I'm always very cautious talking about my kids because I want to preserve their privacy, you know, so only share what you want to share. But I will say that of my four, um, of the one that went to the most highly regarded, quote unquote, public Ivy, that school was probably the one that did the least for him. Mm. Um, Mm. And the schools that my other kids went to, which were lesser names, smaller, but more pastoral. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think so much of it... You know, I was all about the big research university because that was the experience I had. I loved going to UCLA. I loved the sports. I loved the sorority. I loved the big. I remember when I got there thinking, I'll never run out of new people to meet. Like that was (laughs) just so my temperament, right? So when we moved to Ohio and we visited Ohio State, I was like, oh, this is where I want my kids to go. And two of them went there. But I had one who did a great books program in a very small school, and it was the perfect choice for him. So I do think it's really important to not set your sights on some kind of um, vision that is just based on your own sort of neuroses or experience.
experience. Uh, I, I'm with you on that. And I like what you said about this, you know, how do we scrap for credits and all of that? Mm-hmm. I'm not in this generation. So sometimes I want to be careful about, about assuming things that I don't know, because, you know, things feel different to them than they felt to me, right? They're yeah. in a different time frame. Well, and you know, I just had this interesting discussion with our academic dean at the Well-Trained Mind Academy, because at the academy, which, you know, we do online classes, we don't offer AP or mm-hmm. I'm doing bunny ears again. Nobody can see me when I do bunny ears. It's so disorienting. <laughs> AP or quote unquote honors classes, because I think in large part, we don't want to get sucked into that this learning will mean more because it has a label attached to it that you can show to a college admissions officer. And yet at the same time, we understand that kids exist in this world. Right. I'd love to be able to do a more coherent job of explaining why honors or AP Mm -hmm. is not a good thing to point your kid towards. But then I also understand this panic that so many parents, I don't know how much the kids feel it, but parents feel a panic about getting kids into school. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that is the thing that has changed the most when I talk to parents of younger children now, parents who are just starting out on homeschooling. I feel like that, and you know, I, I could be distorting this a bit, but I feel like 15 years ago when I was a lot more active on the homeschool circuit, when a parent of a young child came to me, the first thing they wanted to know was, how do I get this kid to read? How do I make sure that they're okay? How do I make sure that they love learning? And now I would say overwhelmingly, parents of second and third and fourth graders say, how am I going to get them into college? Oh my mm-hmm. gosh, I know. I No, that's really true. I think that's accurate. And, and also post-COVID, after the pandemic, everybody is thinking about school at home. And my whole mission has been to help them understand that homeschool is an educational philosophy. It's not just a behavior. Mm -hmm. I think one of the differences, just heading back to this history of homeschooling, when I came into homeschooling, we read books about the philosophy of learning. Mm -hmm. That was our goal. I was like trying to understand how do you educate? What is learning? How do I know it's happening? Today, parents come into homeschooling because they hate the school. They're leaving the school Mm -hmm. and then they're like, well, how do I find first grade curriculum? Mm -hmm. I was like, well, do you even know what learning is? Do you think you're Mm -hmm. just going to? I had someone who I really respect ask me if they could hire a babysitter to do the homeschooling for them. And I was like, okay, I... I I don't know what you're asking. Like mm-hmm. you're going to bring a person into what stand over a child at a table and supervise? Is that what you think homeschooling is? Boarding school without the boarding. Right. He was this this father was worried about sort of the liberal agenda of the local public school, so ironic, and he wanted to just not do it though, mm-hmm. but he wanted it to happen. And that's what I hear more of. There's a loss. So what I try to mm-hmm. recommend is, you know, read a book. I mean, I have a book, you have a book, read Charlotte Mason, read John Holt, read read John Taylor Gatto, like get into the slipstream of what is education and learning, Peter Gray, so that you start to experience what it might mean to be an educator, not just a schooler. I think that's really important. It's interesting to think about... This relationship between educator and parent, because Julie, you and I both know that all parents are educators, right? Right. Whether or not, whether or not you take on the task of formally doing the first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade work. But if you are a parent educator, as all parents are, and you do choose to take on that task, you really do have to think a little more deeply, perhaps. And, And you're right. You and I have both written about this. And Susanna will link all of this wonderful stuff in the show notes about, okay, but now what am I doing? Now that I'm, we're starting first grade, what is my goal here? Is my goal to get my kid into a good college? Because if it is, we need to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Is my goal to produce a functioning adult? That's a great Mm -hmm. goal. Mm -hmm. Is my goal to produce a functioning adult who really loves to read? That might actually be out of your power. Mm -hmm. Although you can encourage it, you can't create it. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that we have to be very explicit about. And, you know, one of the things that I recommend to, to parents, and it's mostly moms when I do this 
these workshops at conventions is go away from your kid and in a notebook on a piece of paper that they will never find or on a password protected computer, write down exactly what it is that you're trying to do here and whether or not it's working. Wow. I'm serious. I say Mm -hmm. write down where you're disappointed with your kid. This is why Mm. it has to be private, Private. right? Because you've got to articulate. And a lot of times until you put things down in writing, I mean, as a writer, Julie, I know you'll appreciate this. I I know that until you write something down, you don't really understand it. You haven't really articulated or acknowledged it. You may think that you're acknowledging it, but until you put it in words on paper, you haven't. What is it that you're trying to achieve? What is it that's your goal? And have a look at that and then decide what steps am I going to take towards this? And then be very honest with yourself. What part of achieving this goal is within my control and what part is not? I mean, beautiful. Step one, two, three, four, right there. It's so good. It's the challenge. I'm I'm sitting here absorbing this as a new mom and and I'm hearing, you know, what you said about the pressure to get into college. I felt that even though my parents weren't putting that on me. Mm. You know, my parents, they didn't care, but as a high schooler, I want to take all the AP classes. I wanted to get into a good school. I want to prove the world that I was I could do it, you know? And it was it wasn't from my parents. It was from this sort of pervasive that was the current thing, I think. And all that to say that it sounds like, you know, when you're educating your own children, there will always be a a current thing. And sometimes exercises like the one you just outlined, Susan, can help you step outside of that because there's so much pressure on parents with whatever the current thing is and not always necessarily the best thing for your unique child. Absolutely. And I I think one of the great values in putting it down in writing between you and the paper and your God (laughs) is that once you do that, you can look at it and recognize what voice is telling you that. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, I think for many of us, it's a parent's voice Mm -hmm. that's saying, this is what my grandchild needs to be. Or it's a pastor's voice or it's a past teacher's voice or it's someone from the community that was influential. But we've got to hear that voice and I identify it to know whether or not we really actually want to be doing what that voice says. Mm -hmm. I really love that. You know, one of the activities that I recommend inside of our membership community in this one document that they use, um, I got this activity from Betty Edwards, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain and Drawing on the Artist Within. She has you do these certain activities that are drawing activities. And so what I invite parents to do is instead of using words, words is important too. I, I love what you just said, but this is yet another idea that they could try. Um, Allow yourself to draw abstractions about your child. So you think of your child for a moment and you can draw straight lines or circles or bubbles, but it's not meant to be like a sailboat. My child loves boats, so I drew a boat. No, that's not it. You're drawing your impression of your experience of your child. And then when you finish that, do that for several minutes, three, four minutes, then you just observe it and you ask yourself what words come to mind that represent what you drew. And a lot of parents find this very squishy to try initially, and then very powerful afterwards. Because what often happens is you actually do know things about your child that you're ignoring, that you take for granted, that you assume you know. And by allowing this sort of intuitive or image-based process, you start to see a different version of who that kid is. And I think that's the big... So what I love about what you're suggesting is you're making visible, you're making... um, aware to yourself the things that you expect of your child that sometimes control your behavior, right? So we're saying, Mm -hmm. oh, I expect this of my child and it's controlling how I treat my child. This flip side is saying, what are things about my child that I actually know are there, but I ignore? These are things that I could be actually featuring, supporting and noticing. So you've got this child that's all bubbles and, and curves, and yet you've been trying to make them follow some kind of linear curriculum, right? Or vice versa, right? You start to get in touch with, well, what kind of child am I trying to educate? And I think for me, the biggest humbling thing that maybe you can only see in hindsight, but if I can be helpful to those on the forward momentum, is just how much you don't know about your child, how much their interior life is unavailable to you, how much you don't know what they're thinking, how much you don't know what their aspirations are. And so the more that you can stay humble and curious, the better chance you have of bringing about an education that will suit them. Well, you know, and I think this is one of the 
one of the powerful aspects of being a parent is that you realize um, how little your parents knew about you. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. Right. Exactly. And and you're able to forgive so much because mm. and and look, I have I've I've had a great relationship with both of my parents. My dad died in May of this year. I am taking care now of my 88-year-old mother and we're on great terms, but continually, especially now that she's older, she'll say something to me and I'll think, "You have absolutely no idea who I am, do you? You don't know this." And and we have to take that attitude and bring it to our children as well and just be unendingly gracious. Gracious. Mm. Gracious is such a great word. It's but such it, a great word. It Because it encompasses patience, endurance. Also, you know, a, you know, a certain no, you can't trample on me and do something wrong, but forgiveness. Yes. Acknowledgement of our own wrongs. It's just such a beautiful word. Do you know that my, I have three sort of secular devotionals? They're like daily readings and they're called a gracious space. And there's oh, one no, for I fall, didn't. winter and spring. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. They're self-published, but they're basically... A, a daily reading with a quote and a sustaining thought. And the goal of those is to help people each day with their homeschool enter it with something they're thinking about. Because I feel like one of the things that's lacking in home education, it's the endless hamster wheel. You never have closure. Yeah. You're not quite sure what you're focused on each day. Yeah, but, but if you can have one sublime idea to sort of guide today, you can at least measure yourself against that, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea might be eye contact. (laughs) Make (laughs) eye contact with one child today. Don't only issue commands looking over their heads, like actually get down at their eye level. Or another day, it might be actually patiently hearing the curious curiosity of a child instead mm-hmm. of pushing them through the curriculum, mm-hmm. right? And I feel mm-hmm. like that that is the the gift you can give your children as a parent if you have the possibility of knowing those things exist, right? So, yeah. And I, I feel like as a parent of young adults, one of my gracious practices is when they tell me something is to be like, huh, and leave it there. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love because that. Because so often I want to say, What? And to use one of our favorite family expressions, the flag nod, are you talking about? (laughs) And instead, I just try to be. It's so funny. You know, when you were talking about um, that, we don't know what our kids are thinking. I was at Thanksgiving dinner a few years ago. My adult kids were all here and they started having these inside jokes about a TV show they used to watch. (laughs) And I turned to them and I said, wait, you watched that TV show? (laughs) They had seen all the seasons. I didn't even know they had ever seen it. I said, when was this happening? They're like, mom, every night you made dinner and you let us watch TV. I'm like, but I was in the same room. How did I miss that? And I think that's just such a good example of how you think you're in track with everything, but you've got your own full mind that they don't have access to as well. And until they have kids, they won't fully appreciate just how full that brain was of, yeah. you know, your yearnings for them. I mean, that's and, also and you, true. And you and you have to have faith. You have to have faith. You that do. These are the people that God gave to you. This is where my Christian faith comes in. These are the people that God gave to you, and they actually have a relationship with God, which is outside of my control. Thank goodness, because I can only manage my own relationship with God. I don't need to be managing theirs. And they will be okay, because I am not the only person speaking speaking into their lives that's and making right. sure that they're okay. And that's mm-hmm. that's huge as they get older. In the 12-step programs, they always say about the other person, they have their own higher power and I'm not it. <laughs> yes. always, that's such a great line. <laughs> I, I think we we all need to appreciate that. All right. So, so Julie, your most recent book is Raising Critical Thinkers. And there's a workbook too, I think. Yes, there is. Um, Becoming a Critical Thinker is written for 13 to 18-year-olds. And I took the activity from Raising Critical Thinkers, plus added a bunch more. Uh, it's written in sort of a journaling format. You can write right in the book. Uh, and it's been a really fun tool to see people start using. You know, they're just getting started and I'm very eager for more feedback. But one of the one of the pieces of feedback I've been getting is that it has promoted really meaningful conversations between okay. parents and teens around issues that are important to both of them. And it gives that parent a framework for how to discuss something without becoming Becoming a propagandist or, you know, some kind of indoctrinator. So anyway, yes. Yeah, so those are the two. And then I have a new book coming out next year in April, but uh, I haven't quite announced it yet, but it will be on 
the shelves and I will be announcing soon in my social spaces. So if you want to follow me and hear about that. Ooh, and we'll, ha- we'll have you back to talk about it. Yes. Awesome. That's so nice. I will link all of that in the show notes. One thing we're trying to do this season is give folks um, links and things to dive deeper in each episode. So I appreciate you all sharing both your personal experiences, but lots of different readings and resources that um, are practical in this episode. So I'll link those all in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh my gosh. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me back. I'll come anytime, Susan. (laughs) All right. We'll do it again. Thank you for listening to the Well-Trained Mind Podcast. You can find Susan at facebook.com slash susan.wise.bauer and Susanna on Instagram at hop into homeschool. Our engineering and mixing is done by AJ Filari at ajfilari.online. This podcast is produced by Well-Trained Mind Press and our supervising producer is Chris Bauer. If you enjoyed the show, help us out by rating and reviewing us wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have questions, responses, or ideas for future episodes, email us at podcast at We'll be back next week, so stay tuned. Oh,